be. Well, our uh, great drama that we call the Book of Revelation has been unfolding before us for many weeks now. And today we come to a climax. We come to uh, the final battle uh, when the dragon and the beast and are all put away. They're slain. And God brings an end to all of this uh, turmoil that, that's been going on. And you know, we, we've talked about this in, in terms of pageantry and drama and, and that sort of thing. And, and I think rightly so. And today, we've seen uh, characters come into our script. And today, we're going to see them go out. And we might simply say that God has written them out of the script at this point. The final conflict that leads to the complete establishment of God's kingdom was begun, you will remember, with the, the pregnant woman. You remember in, in uh, Revelation chapter 12. And, and that symbolized sort of the first coming of Jesus Christ. And now we live in that time between then and this great last battle that we're going to look at today. But before we do that, I want to review just a little bit for you, just to kind of freshen our minds about what we've covered. Now you remember, as I said, we, we first met the dragon in chapter 12 of Revelation and he was waiting for this heavenly woman to deliver a child so that he could devour the child, right? And they're out in the wilderness. Now I want you to picture this in your mind. And we're doing the pageantry thing still. Uh, here you have a, a pregnant woman who is about to give birth to a child in a wilderness setting. Now. What could be more vulnerable than that? I mean, you think about it. There she is with no one to protect her, no one to help her, no one to help her deliver this child. She has to be in great distress, a great agony, great fear. And then what shows up? With this great dragon waiting to devour the child. That's a pretty horrific scene, is it not? Yeah. And does it not look like, if when we're looking with our human eyes at this scene, does it not look like that the dragon is certain to win? Of course. But what happens? Remember? The child is what? Caught up into heaven. Out of the dragon's reach. The dragon is unable to touch the child. So then what does the dragon do? He turns his wrath on the woman's other children, i.e. the church, you and I. Then we meet some, some other villains. We meet the beast. You remember the terrifying power that, that he represents? The, the ruthlessness of the pagan empires, both past and present. And we, we see that ruthlessness every day, don't we? The, the carnage in the Middle East, the carnage in the Ukraine, and, and on it goes. And so it's been since the beginning of time, and it will be until the end of time. The false prophet who deceives the world into worshiping the beast. And finally, the, the harlot Babylon. That system that seduces us even as Christians. It, that sends that siren song out to us to get us to turn our eyes off of the things of Christ and, and on to the things that she offers. And you remember we took note uh, when we, we saw her described in the book. She's very beautiful. She's adorned with uh, jewels and things, right? And, and what does she offer us? You remember? She offers us a golden chalice. It all looks so good, so inviting, but it's filled with bitterness and gall. The dragon, as I said, though prevented from destroying the child, now wages war on the rest of her children. And that's why Paul wrote in Ephesians 6, 12, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. 
And we, we've talked about that at various times that, you know, we, we see people do evil things, we see people do hurtful things, we, we see all sorts of injustice. And we need to look beyond the cause to the first cause, which isn't those people, it's Satan who is driving those people. Now, as Christians, I got a, a blog the other day, it says, why are Christians sometimes such jerks? And the blogger goes on to give several reasons. But it's true. Sometimes we are. Well, maybe not you, but I am sometimes. I, I don't try to be. It just comes natural to me. I have to try to be like Christ. Because my fallen nature, I'm not like Christ. So, Christians do bad things too. Not because Satan controls us, because the Holy Spirit dwells within us and he's not going to share his home with Satan. But he does influence us when we allow it to happen. That's why we need to be in God's Word, we need to be with God's people, we, we, we need to uh, constantly be uh, working towards becoming more Christ-like. So, we have a question then. Who is strong enough to destroy the dragon and put an end to persecution and suffering of God's people at the dragon's hand? Well, I'm sure we all know the answer to that question. We saw it in chapter 5. You remember in chapter 4, the, just like here... Our reading today started with the opening of heaven, so John could see into heaven and see what was happening. Chapter 4, the heavens are open, John can see into heaven and see what's happening. And if you remember what was happening, uh, there was a scroll, and, no, and as we move into chapter 5, we have the scroll, and no one is able to open the scroll, and John begins to weep. And then one of the elders says to John, don't weep. For there is one worthy to open the scroll, there the Lion of Judah. And what did John see when he turned and looked at the Lion of Judah? He saw a lamb. The Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who was qualified to open the seal. Now, we need to remember these things because they help us to cognitively work through other things. Now, the elder, was the elder wrong when he said, there is a lion? And when John looked at the lion, he didn't see a lion, he saw a lamb. That's the language of Revelation, that's the genre of the literature we're looking at. Things can be more than one thing. And they can, it can be a perfectly accurate description. So yes, the elder was right. It was the Lion of Judah. And yes, John saw the Lamb of God. Both our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. So who will be able to overcome the dragon? Jesus. And so we come to the champion in our story. Now, Revelation 19, 11 through 16, that Cherie read for us. So I won't read it all, but I'll refer to it as we go through here. This new vision cycle, as heaven is opened once again, we see neither a lion nor a lamb. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True in Righteousness. He judges and makes war. Now, when we look, we see our champion, Jesus Christ, mounted on a white horse, judging and making war. A little different picture from the Lamb, isn't it? Yes, it is. So, what can this mean? talked about white horses. 
And we know that, we remember now we recall that we have to read all of these things in context and this book was written to real churches and real people in the first century. And when you mentioned a white horse to them, they would immediately equate that with a conqueror. You remember how the Romans did it? You would go out and you would go to war. You would win the war, win the battle. You would come back. When the troops came back, they wouldn't come into the city. They would come back and they would camp a mile or so outside of the city. And they would stay there in camp while the city made preparations to receive them, the big party. And the, the commander uh, would get a white horse to ride in on because it was a symbol of triumph. It was a symbol that he had conquered. And so when we see this white horse, it immediately tells the people in those seven churches, we're going to win. This is victory. It's ours because he's on this white horse. And then we see that he has eyes of fire. His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. Eyes of fire. No one can hide from his piercing gaze. Remember, where does God look? On the inside. Man looks on the outside. He knows what's going on in each and every one of our hearts and our minds. And no one can hide from it. He has multiple crowns, symbol of his authority. He has authority over all and everything. And he has a name that, that no one knows. Well, again, if we go back to ancient times, names were much more important than they are today. Today they're pretty much meaningless except to identify us. He's Steve and I'm Daryl and you can tell the difference because he's smarter than us. Well, we don't know about that, but we know he can sing better than I can. <laughs> yes. But it, in their setting, a name, if you knew someone's name, you had some authority over them. You, you, you could give them direction. You could instruct them. And God, you remember, remember when Moses wanted to know God's name? You, you remember in, in Exodus? And there's this little dialogue going on between God and Moses. And God's telling Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh. And I want you to do this and do that and do the other thing and lead your people out of there. And, and Moses says, well, they're not going to listen to me. Uh, who can I tell them sent me? And what did God say? He said, I am that I am. Never reveals his name. He just is. And so it is here. But then we see that there is a name written on his side there, and it is what? Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Lord of Lords and King of Kings. That's as high as you can get. We sing a song, no one is greater, no one is higher. And that's what he's saying here. I have all these crowns. I have this title. It's not really his name, it's a title. Lord of Lords and King of Kings. I'm on this white horse. I've got this sword. If you're my people, you can relax. I've got it all in here. See, this is good news for those of us who know him as our Lord and Savior already. Because when he comes to judge the world, guess who he won't be judging? Us. Because we were judged at the cross. We don't have to be concerned with it. It's going to be a great day for us. Christians who have experienced or will soon experience the atrocities of which human evil and injustice are capable will now be vindicated. There's a theologian, contemporary 
the theologian, and I'll mess up his name, but it, it's Miroslav Volf. And uh, he, he's written several books, but his, his uh, biggest selling book is called Exclusion and Embrace. And uh, he's a, uh, a Serbian or Croatian, one of the two. I get you know, mixed up all the time. But anyway, he was there during their big conflict. And as a Christian, he was there. And he, in his book, Exclusion and Embrace, he's talking about how when we're in a setting like that and we're, we're seeing our wives or our husbands or our children murdered, raped, all those sorts of things, how as Christians can we offer grace and forgiveness to those who are perpetrating those kinds of things. And his conclusion is, the only way we can be able to do that is if we are convinced that in the end, justice will prevail. And by the end, he means this day, when Christ returns. And I think he's right. I think he's right. Because there is no justice in those settings in a contemporary sense. But how do we be gracious to those people? I don't know. I mean, you, you'll net, you, those are things you, questions you really can't answer until you're in that setting when it's happening to you. But I would hope we could look beyond what's happening to us in the immediate to what's going to happen to us one day when God puts an end to injustice. Look at verses uh, 14 through 16. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine living, linen, white and pure, were following on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he'll rule them with a rod of iron. He'll tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he was, has a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God. Those who have died in Christ are now going to receive justice. You remember our martyrs cry from what is it, chapter 6 I believe it is, when they cried out, when oh God are you going to just vindicate us? Well now they know. Right here. Right now. So let's look at this last battle, just briefly. We're going to look at it twice, because it's, it's played out for us here twice. The same battle. First one is here in verses 17 through 21. Then I saw the angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead. Come gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who was in his presence, and had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Now that's a comforting scene, isn't it? Again, now, you know, to, to us, to our modern minds, this is a rather uh, macabre dinner invitation, isn't it? He's inviting all the birds to come gorge themselves on the flesh of men and horses. But, transport yourself back to the first century. What happened in war? They went out, they engaged one another with swords and various weapons that they had. One side would win, maybe they would cut down thousands. And what did they do with those thousands? They, they plundered them, took anything of value, and left them there to rot. So what did the birds do? The birds came and had dinner. So what he's describing here would be, now to us it's all, oh, Jesus. But to the first century Christian, he's simply describing a battle scene. 
So the important thing for us isn't the birds and isn't the fact that it, it uh, goes against our sensitivities a little bit. But the important thing is to know that this is the fulfillment of the battle prophesied in Ezekiel 38 39, if you're familiar with that. Now, it's interesting that we are not given any description of the battle itself. Did you notice that? It's just, come on birds, we're going to have a battle, and then we leave it, the battle's over and the birds are doing their thing. We are told the consequences of the battle. And I want you to note its scope here in verse 18. The flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. So who is going to be killed in this battle? Everybody doesn't know the war. Doesn't matter their status. It only matters are the children of God or children of wrath. There will be no human survivors except for the followers of Christ who won't take part in the battle of any other than to be behind Jesus. Notice, only two now, notice this, only the beast and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. The rest are slain by the sword. A reminder to us that they are not individuals, but systems and structures that oppose God and his people. The beast and the false prophet. So we, we go on a futile trip when we try to identify them as this individual or that individual or whoever it is. Because they're not. They're systems. So that's the first take. Now let's look at the same battle again. Revelation chapter 20, verse 7 through 10. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea, and they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them, and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now we see our old foe, the dragon, Satan, and the battle from his point of view. Remember now, we opened the church age, if you will, and I hesitate to use that word because a lot of times people misuse it. But we opened the church age with a Satan waiting to devour the child, right? And it looked like the child didn't have a chance. Now we're closing it really in the same fashion. Look what we have here. Satan shows up with this army like the sands of the sea. In other words, huge. And what does he do? He surrounds the beloved city, the church, he surrounds it and he's just waiting to give out. Doesn't look like the city has a chance. The city's just like the child. It's vulnerable. It's surrounded by this mighty army. But what happens? Fire comes down from heaven and wipes them all out. Instantly. Boom. That's it. They're done. And Satan is tossed into the lake of fire along with the beast and the false god. That's pretty good news, by the way. You see? How many times is it that way in our lives? We're in a situation, we're facing something, and it looks like we don't have a chance. This thing's too big for us, it's too overwhelming for us, we just can't do this anymore. And then God in the Sometimes it's a great big thing, sometimes it's a small thing, but then God intervenes. And that's the kind of God we serve. We may think, may look like we're surrounded by this mighty army so numerous nobody can number it. It may seem like we're a 
vulnerable pregnant woman with a dragon waiting to devour our child, and there's no way around that. But how often in Scripture do we read these words, but God, but God, and God does something. In both takes on this last great battle, we are told virtually nothing about the actual details of the fighting. What we are told is that from the first coming of our Lord until he returns again, Satan will bring everything he has to bear on the destruction of the church. You wonder why life is hard sometimes? There you go. That's why life is hard sometimes. This is why Jesus told us, John chapter 16, verse 33, remember? I know you all do. You may not be able to dredge it up immediately, but you'll remember, in this world, this is what Jesus promises us now, in this world you'll have a good time. Of course not. What does he say? In this world you will have tribulation. It's not always going to be easy. Just because you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior doesn't mean he's going to fix your career, fix your marriage, fix your car, fix your whatever. He may, but that's not what he promises to do for us. But here's what he said. In the midst of that tribulation, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And the, the, the tense in that verse is what you want to really focus on. He does not say, be of good cheer because I will overcome the world. He says, be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. In God's view, this battle's already taken place. It's a settled issue. Now for us, we're waiting because we're creatures of time. God is not. He's an infinite being. But he assures us there's no possibility that this is going to go any other way. Because for him, it's an accomplished fact. He has overcome the world. And Christian, that's good news for you and for I. And if you're here today and you're not a Christian, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, remember there are only going to be two groups when this thing comes to a culmination. There are going to be the children of God and the children of His wrath. I implore you to make sure you're a child of God. And how do you do that? You do that by simply saying in the quietness of your heart, Lord, I need a Savior and I need you to be my God. And that's it. You're in, you're done. Now, then you can start that journey of becoming more and more Christ-like as you go. But the journey is not the important part. And how Christ-like you become isn't even the, the important part. The important part is that you make that decision, you make that choice for Jesus Christ. Because then you pass from judgment into life. And the rest will just sort of happen. Pray with me. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that uh, you have overcome the world. That all of these things that we're looking at and studying and hopefully finding so interesting and helping us to grow in our, our faith and uh, dependence upon you, uh, for you are all accomplished facts. And all you are asking of us is that we place our faith in you. And so, Lord God, we do that. I know that those of us who know you, it's a, it's a one-time event as far as becoming members of your kingdom. But it's a journey of becoming like you. So, Lord, help us as we walk that journey. Help us to become more and more gracious, loving, forgiving, kind, all of those things. Help us, Lord, to be Christians who truly love one another as you have loved us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.